So, Prophets 2, give a little quick orientation on Prophets 2. Prophets 2, we're dealing with Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, the three prophets that ministered just before the dispersion of, or yes, the dispersion of Judah in the south of 586 BC. That's when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. God brought the Babylonians down to destroy the temple on account of the sin that existed in Jerusalem by the people of Judah. So Prophets 2 is going to deal with that, with, with that subject area, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the temple plus the dispersion of Judah in 586 BC. So we'll be spending a good, a good portion of time, six, seven classes, hopefully not, not, too, much, too, not too much more than seven classes in uh, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. All right. I think we have enough. Yep. Okay, so tonight our goal, our mission tonight is to wrap up our study guides and complete our review of Prophets 1. So you said that we were in Prophet uh, Study Guide 2? Study Guide 5? Oh. All right. Wow. Well, we're almost done. Section 2. So study guide 5 is the last study guide. Section 2, which is the hope of God's manifestation. Is that right? Yeah. Section 2, study guide 5. Study Guide 5, right, Section 2. We're dealing with the prophet Joel, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so uh, judgment has come on the land. Uh, we, we, we didn't do a lot of studying in the book of Joel. The book of Joel is... Very, very small, three chapters. And you think, well, there's not much to it. But in fact, there's quite a bit to the book of Joel. The book of Joel, from my point of view, is a very, very important book. It's sort of a synopsis of God's work of redemption captured in three, three chapters. So if you look at the book of Joel and you apply a timeline to the book of Joel, you'll see that chapter one of Joel deals with the, the sin of Israel. All right, so remember that Joel... He was a prophet while Israel was still, uh, the northern kingdom was still in the land of Israel. Uh, the northern kingdom had not yet been destroyed. And so he was, he was ministering, speaking effectively to all of Israel, north and south. And so he begins his, his incredible book, three chapters, in dealing with the dispersion that will come upon Israel. The punishment that God will bring upon Israel, how God will send them out of the land, he will, he will drive, he'll drive them out. Uh, many references we see there in chapter 1, chapter 2, right about midway in chapter 2, begins to, it begins to soften quite a bit. God's, God's focus in chapter 2 of Joel becomes the restoration of Israel, pointing to that time when God will bring them back and restore them in, in the land of Israel. Chapter, chapter 2, verse 15, for instance, Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather all the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. And so you see that shift in focus in chapter 2 of Joel. And then towards the end of chapter 2, it becomes obvious that we're dealing with the time of the redemption, the Geula, or what, what, the, what I would refer to as a great redemption. And so that's what, that's what we see at the end of chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, we see a great conflict. That great conflict is, I believe, uh, we believe, Armageddon. In fact, I'm convinced that the conflict we see in chapter 3 of Joel is what we call Armageddon. This is when God will fight on behalf of his people Israel, and he will humble the nations. He will bring the nations down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. We talked about the valley of Jehoshaphat a little bit. And so this is, this is the book of Joel, very, very condensed, but very powerful. Again, if you were to apply a timeline to the book of Joel, you'll be amazed as to how, how succinct it is. 
with all of the, with all of the prophets, right? So Israel dispersed, judged because of her sin. Uh, in the diaspora, God begins to deal with her. He begins the process of bringing her back, and then when He does ultimately bring her back to the land, He prepares judgment for the nations. Three steps, very simple. Okay, so let's begin to look at that study guide. Judgment has come up, come on the land. What is the instrument of judgment? Locust. Locust, and we see that in chapter 1. Compare Joel chapter 1, 12 to Isaiah chapter 55, 12. What is the difference? Isaiah 55, 12. Someone read that for us tonight if you would. Isaiah 55, verse 12. Okay, maybe I'll find it here. Isaiah 55, verse 12. Let me get it. Or ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace, the mountains, and the hills shall break forth before you with the singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And conversely, in chapter 1, of Joel, verse 12, the vine dries up, the fig tree fails, the pomegranate and the palm also on the apple tree, all the trees of the field dry up. Indeed, rejoice and dries up from the sons of men. Now, it's really referring here to Israel. All right, so this is, again, God is preparing to judge Israel on account of her unrighteousness. Much of chapter 1 is in that, in that lamenting form, uh, very dismal, very, judge, very, very judgment-oriented. So then uh, B, section B, in, uh, B of section 2. What does Joel exhort Judah to do? To repent, fast and prayer. We see that in Joel chapter, two, chapter two, uh, 12 to 17 again. In chapter 2 is where God begins to re return his favor to Israel. So he's calling on repentance here on, on behalf of Israel. All right, so it's chapter 2. Someone read, if you would. Let's, let's do a little reading tonight. Someone read, if you would, chapter 2, 12 to 17. If you can get that for us, it'll be great. Joel chapter 2, 12 to 17. No? Okay, good. That's good. All right. So we read from 12 to 18. So you see, this is where the shift away from the focus of God's judgment upon, upon the people of Israel begins to turn. God is calling for repentance. And there's a promise there that if they would, in fact, repent, God, God's favor will return to them. And so this is, this is clearly that turning point in that timeline. If we were to do a timeline, you would see that at a given point, there's a turn, a turn towards God on behalf of the people of Israel. So God has, in his, in his judgment, in his mercy, in his judgment upon Israel, he has ordained a time for Israel to return to him, 
in the Psalm, Psalm 102, 102 of Psalm, Psalm 102, verse 9, I believe it is, God says that there's a set time to favor Zion, an, an appointed time, a time that God has appointed to return favor to Zion, Zion there, of course, being synonymous with Israel. So this is that time, all right, this is that appointed time when God will return his favor to Zion, and clearly, that's what we're, that's what we're seeing here now. Some maybe uh, 300 years following this, this, this uh, prophecy by Joel, we read the story of Jehoshaphat, right? King Jehoshaphat. And when King Jehoshaphat found himself in trouble, what did he do? He called for exactly what Joel is calling for here. He called for a nationwide fast and a humbling of self. All of the children, all of the, the women, the men, Everyone came up to Jerusalem from, from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin and fasted in Jerusalem, and God responded. So this is, what, this is what we see here. God will respond to our hardship when we humble ourselves, call upon his name, and surrender to him in this way. So this is what, this is what the prophet Joel is seeing here. Now let's see question two. If Judah will do this, what will God do? All right, he will, restore, he will restore favor and his blessings upon the people of Israel. All right, let's, let's move on. God says that he will pour out his spirit. spirit on all flesh, all mankind. What did Peter see as the fulfillment of this? Acts chapter 2. Peter got up to preach after he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he very clearly recognized that what we see here in Joel chapter 2, the promise of God's Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh, it was the fulfillment of what he saw. Well, what he saw was the fulfillment of that in Acts chapter 2. So from that moment onwards, we begin to see what we call in Christian, uh, Christian terminology, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the pouring out of God's Holy Spirit. Now, this is, this is absolutely true, but from the standpoint of the redemption of Israel, this, this text that we see here in Joel chapter 2, 28 to 32 is referring to redemption in the midst of Israel. Not that this redemption will not affect the nations, of course it will, and it does. Now, on the day of Pentecost, Shavuot in Jerusalem, as, as it relates to the church, this scripture was cer certainly applicable to the church on the day of Pentecost, absolutely. But there's a greater fulfillment of this that's yet to come in the future. And I believe that, of course, Sukkot, um, Shavuot, excuse me, does, does, does correspond to this, of course. So let's read, I'm gonna read 28 to 32 of chapter two of the book of Joel. So this here is sort of the, the apex of the work of redemption as it relates to the nation of Israel from the standpoint of, of the book of Joel. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even on the male and the female servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, so again, clearly this is a Pentecostal reference, but there, there comes a time in the future where this would be much broader. And so many times in Christianity we talk about we talk about uh, revival, and certainly there's a great revival coming, and there's been many great revivals since their Pentecost 2,000 years ago. But this is the essence of revival. And I believe that as it relates to this eschatology, uh, the, the end, time, end time reality, the fulfillment of what Joel sees, it's gonna become more and more profound, more and more uh, real. We're gonna see more of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the church, we're gonna see more of it. And it's going to be powerful. It's gonna be also, not only upon the church, but I believe it will be in Israel as well. I think it will be powerfully uh, uh, represented in the people of Israel. Yes, the people of Israel will be having these very same baptism experience. The Holy Spirit will be falling out upon them as well. Now, I'm not gonna get into the, theo the theology of that, but I, I ju I'm just convinced of it because this prophecy is actually pointed to Israel. It's speaking to Israel. 
So, so verse 30, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So you've heard about the blood moons, of course, a few years ago, uh, 2014, 2015, you had what was called tetrads, which were blood moons on, on Pesach and on, on Sukkot. Two, two years consistently and, and fallen right on the biblical festivals and uh, many people myself included believed that they were significant I certainly didn't believe that it was going to be the end of the world uh, many people uh, developed the, the notion the idea that this would be the coming of Messiah the day of the Lord I, I said for sure it's it's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna happen before the day of the Lord just as Joel said, but it doesn't have anything to do with the necessarily the coming of Jesus directly at that time. I, I, my position was this was going to be a sign unto the nations, and a sign, clearly a sign to the nations, and it was. It was, and, and, and very much so and a sign to Israel as well. And since, since 2014, 2015, we've been seeing many upheavals in the earth, particularly with the nations. Uh, we've been, we, we saw it. It was in 2014 or 2015 at the end of the Tetrads that our, our beloved Pope uh, came to this country and announced the new world order, uh, new world order in terms of uh, a world religion, a world government, and the means by which it would be accomplished, which is to bring the refugees into this country by the hundreds of thousands and uh, destabilize the country. This is what the Pope talked about. When you get behind the, the, the careful language, that, that's what he said. And so clearly the sign was, was not accepted by the nations. The blood moons were making a statement. And the statement, again, was in fact pointed to the nations, which was God is favoring his people. He's given, us, he's given you to, to witness blood moons on the two most important festivals. His festivals, Shavuot, excuse me, uh, Pesach and Sukkot, two years consistently. And so th that sign, again, was for, was for the nations. So the sun will, will turn into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So the, the great and awesome day of the Lord is coming, all right? The day when he comes and he brings, he brings, uh, he brings his kingdom, Father's kingdom, and establish, establishes that kingdom in Jerusalem that day, is before us. Let's read verse 32. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So salvation, deliverance. Who will ever, who, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be delivered. Delivered from what? Specifically delivered from what? What do you think? Delivered from the heart, from the, from the tribulation, from the hardship that will be visited upon the nations. And that's the deliverance. And, and we tend to apply this to personal salvation. And it's not that you, you cannot apply it to, to personal salvation, but it is not context in, in, in regards to personal salvation. When you read that, it's speaking of, of, a, of, a, of a great time of deliverance for the people of Israel, for deliverance on Mount Zion for those who escape. Escape what? Well, obviously escape the great tribulation and the incredible trouble that will be visited upon humanity. So God is preparing a, a judgment, a, a time of judgment upon the nations. Now, m many times or very often in Christian theology, the idea of a God that will bring judgment is overlooked or ignored completely. And there are very real reasons for that. What do you think the reasons would be for a God who is preparing to bring judgment, to bring correction? Why do you suppose that that emphasis is not looked at or considered at all? And not at all, but in many cases, uh, brushed over or put aside. Why, why is it that in, in modern Christianity, we, we tend to not want to see God in that light? We prefer a more gentler, a kinder God. God is certainly gentle and kind. There's no question about that. 
but he's also a, a God who is jealous for his plan of redemption, for his work of redemption. He has a fix-it program, and he's preparing to fix what has been really, really uh, 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 messed up by humanity, and he's preparing to fix it. So in the process of fixing what is really messed up, he has to implement some corrections. And we call that judgment, and it certainly is judgment. And God certainly exists in that form. And more and more, towards the end of this age, in the beginning of the new age, we will certainly see God, see God in, that, in that context. It's not going to be pleasant. And from, from, a, from a point of view of, of humanity, we're not looking forward to it. But I, I, I'm convinced that God's looking forward to it. In fact, I know very much that God is looking forward to, to bringing that correction, establishing order in this chaos which man has created for himself. So, in that context, there is going to be those who escape on Mount Zion. So, in that context, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord in that day shall be delivered. Right? And that's what it's saying. So, how do we see that? What, what do we, how do we frame that? The day of tribulation, the day of this great conflict. Those who call on God's name will be delivered. There will be those on Mount Zion who will escape. What do you think? Now, when we get to Prophets 3, and we take a long, hard look at Prophets 3, and we begin to see the whole process of redemption from the standpoint of eschatology, we'll begin to understand this a little clearer. But I want to say to you that Mount Zion, at the time of the Great Tribulation, or Jerusalem, at the time of the Great Tribulation that Jesus spoke of, Mount Zion will be effectively the only safe place on the planet. It's my opinion. I have reasons for believing that, all biblical. Uh, Mount Zion will be the only place of, of, uh, of any sense of haven in all the planet. The planet would be in tremendous turmoil. Tremendous turmoil. It will be the times of birth pains. Uh, that's, what the Bible, how, that's how the Bible refers to this time, the time of birth pains. Uh, tremendous pain upon, upon God's creation, upon humanity. But at the end of the birth pain, we know what comes. What comes specifically is redemption. Uh, a millennial kingdom of God's reign in the earth, peace, shalom for all creation. So that's at the end of this period that, we've, that, that we're talking about. But at this time, there would be one place of, of, of God's peace and shalom, I believe, during this time, it would be Jerusalem. The nation certainly would be uh, marching against Jerusalem, and, 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 and I believe that because, because of God's peace upon Jerusalem, the nations would be that much more enraged. So, so God's going to use peace upon Jerusalem in order to bring the nations up to Jerusalem. In other words, whatever God is doing in the, in the earth will prosper in Jerusalem, and it will become an attraction to the nations, a, 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 a flying the ointment, so to speak, and the nations will march against her because of that. Yes? A destruction of Israel? Um, no. I'm not sure why we would be expecting a destruction of Israel. Um, you know, Israel is restored to the land, and according to God's promises, when that happens, uh, Israel will no longer anymore be destroyed or even be judged by God. Um, Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel certainly have experienced the time of Jacob's trouble. They had seven years of that, and we're, away from, we're, we're far removed from that time right now. We're in the time of the restoration of Israel, of the land of Israel, and of, of Jerusalem. God is doing a completely new thing with Israel. And all of the Bible prophecy teachers that we've heard from over the years, many of them are taking things way out of context, such as in Luke chapter 21, when Jesus talked about the destruction of Jerusalem and the difficulties that will come upon Jerusalem. Well, he wasn't referring to Jerusalem restored. He was referring to Jerusalem before 70 AD. And sometimes in Bible prophecy, we tend to convolute issues by applying uh, scenarios that are not historically accurate. And we come up with these notions. For instance, uh, the whole pre-tribulation contraption 
and this is what I call it, the pre-tribulation contraption, has the time of Jacob's trouble ahead of us. When the nations will, will, will just about bring Israel to a complete destruction, um, you know, destroy the city of Jerusalem, build, build the Antichrist temple in Jerusalem, the Antichrist will sit in the temple, all of that, and it's all wrong. Every bit of it wrong. Because they're taking things out of context historically and applying uh, things that are already fulfilled in Bible prophecy to th events that, that supposedly will happen in the future. There's a lot that will happen with Israel in the future, yes, of course. Uh, but the idea of a complete destruction, I, I just don't see it in the Bible. I see God's favor returning to Israel. So the prophet here now is, is referring to this time when clearly we're going to see God's, re God's favor returning to Zion. And he's going to uphold Jerusalem. Those who will escape from the tribulation, from the difficulties that are, that are being uh, carried out in the nations will find safety in Jerusalem. All right. Effectively, it will be the only, only point of God's peace in the earth during this period. Yes? Well, I think it's inevitable. It's only a matter of time before Israel does something definite and finite with the Temple Mount. And they'll, they'll eventually, they'll, they'll correct the mistake of 1967 when they decided to share the Temple Mount with the Jordanians. They'll have no choice but to correct that. It's only a matter of time. Uh, today, in, today in Israel, a seven-year-old child was raped brutally by, by so-called Palestinians. Um, of course, you're not going to hear about such a thing in, in the media, but those things happen continually in the land of Israel. And eventually, a leader will stand up and say, enough of this, we're going to take action. And Israel will take action. And they will, they will effectively uh, remove the obstacle that's on the Temple Mount uh, from the Temple Mount. Now, that's going to be uh, another attraction for the nations to march against Israel. Uh, but it, it's going to happen. You know, in Zechariah chapter 13, it talks about a war, uh, a conflict that will break out in Jerusalem. And half of the city will be held captive. Well, more than half of the city is Palestinian. And so you can see how eventually Israel will say enough of this, and they will march against that, that, that Arab issue that, that, keeps it, that keeps Israel and Jerusalem in a place of bondage. And of course, again, like I said, when that happens, it will certainly hasten the nations to come up against Jerusalem. All right? So clearly here, the prophet has seen a time when God's favor has returned to Israel. And then, all of a sudden, we go from, from, from salvation in Zion, deliverance on Mount, on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and then God's, God's attention moves away from Israel, and it turns to the nations, and not in a very positive way at all. So we'll see that here in a few moments. And so let's go to section, um, where would safety be found? In Jerusalem. After Jerusalem and Judah are, are restored, God will gather all the nations where? To the valley of Jehoshaphat. Let's read that. Chapter 3, 1 and 2, For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. So we're talking about restoration. We're not talking about the times of Jacob's trouble here, right? We're talking about the times of the restoration of Jacob. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Where is the valley of Jehoshaphat? In the Jezreel Valley, which is the Jezreel Valley, sits right in front of Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. So this is effectively the, the battle of Armageddon. All right, that's where we get the word Armageddon from, Har Megiddo, the Jezreel Valley. The Jezreel Valley is the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and they have divided up my land. So the land of 
Israel is divided up today, isn't it? It is. The very fact that, that Jerusalem is not wholly uh, a Jewish capital, and there's so much conflict over the city of Jerusalem right now, speaks to the fact that the land is divided. It isn't fully given over to, to the people of Israel, who is referred to here as his inheritance, my inheritance. All right, I've told you before that the word nachala in Hebrew is very much associated with the Hebrew word for a wedding, which is nachla, or one of the Hebrew words for a wedding, nachla. And this is, this is how important the people of Israel is to God. He sees them as his nachla, his nachala, his inheritance. So this, this, is, this points to that time when the nations are going to receive their due attention from God for the way that they've related to the people of Israel, who God sees and he announces them to be his nachala, his own, his own inheritance. And what is he doing? He's preparing to bring judgment upon the nations because they've, they've, they've scattered his people and they have divided up his land. During the last intifada, the last serious intifada, there's been several intifadas in the last 15, 20 years. There, there was the so-called knife intifada, which was about four or five years ago. Arabs, were go, they were going around stabbing people. Uh, now we're seeing the fire bombs uh, intifada, right? Uprising, the word intifada is an uprising. So one of the intifadas that we've had in the last 15, 20 years were the bombings. All right. Now, the only reason that these intifadas succeeded in the way that they do and they continue to succeed to a certain, to a certain extent is because the nations, the, the governing body of nations, which is the United Nations, sees the Arabs or the Palestinians as needing to be in that land. So they keep the division of the land of Israel constantly in order to do what? To provide for... for, for for the cause of the nations, enough strife in Israel, to keep Israel off balance, to keep Israel from truly prospering. And that's the, that's the purpose of the Palestinians. That's why the Palestinians are there. The Palestinians, the Palestinians are not there by their own efforts. That's just, that's just not at all reality. They're there because an organization or organizations much stronger than themselves have them placed into that, into that land. They're there because of these organizations. So, so these organizations, they represent all of the nations. They're global, global organizations. So here we see very clearly that the nations, as according to God's own indictment, the nations are scattering the people of Israel because during the Intifadas, Jews, I'm talking about Israelis, Sabras, People born and raised in the land of Israel, many of them by the thousands left because of the intifadas. You go to South, Mi South, South Miami area, south of Miami, and you have a, a very large Israeli community down there. Why? Because they fled the intifada. They, they literally scattered because of the dividing up of the land of Israel, enforced by the UN through these intifadas. So you see the process of the scattering continues even to today. This is certainly historically as well, right? So God is going to enter into judgment with the nations because of the fact that they have scattered his inheritance and they've divided up his land. All right. So let's, let's, let's continue. So this the second question here. What are the reasons for God, uh, reasons why God will judge the nations? Because he scattered the people of Israel and they've divided up the land. Compare Joel chapter 3 verse 10 with Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4. So someone read Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4 if you would. Talks about beating your swords into plowshares and your pruning hooks into, into plows, uh, into uh, whatever. Someone read that for me. Isaiah chapter 4 verse 2. Into prune hooks. So God is going to, to make it eventually, He will make it so that the nations will take their weapons and forge them, fashion them into implements for agriculture. 
right? So there will be there will be no more emphasis on war, right? Lo ise goy el goy cherev, lo ilmadu. You you be saying that song all the time, and so God is going to arrange things in such a way that the nations will no longer seek war, particularly with Israel, and all of the implementation will be given towards agriculture, providing for the nations. Now, this is not what Joel sees. Joel, in fact, what, what, what God calls for in Joel chapter 3 verse 10 is the exact opposite. He's calling for the nations to take their implements of agriculture and fashion them into weapons of war. Now, we believe that the Bible, esthetologically, points to epochs, periods of time. The period of time that we're in right now, which it's clear we're about to bring a close to, or God is about to bring a close to, this period of time is marked by man's violence, destructiveness, you know, wars and rumors of wars, increased increase wars around the world. This is what Jesus spoke of that will usher in this great tribulation period. Wars and rumors of wars and so on. And so that's where we are today. We saw, we've seen in the last 100 years, well, 110 years, uh, two world wars. And we're staring down another world war uh, sometime in the not too distant future. So this is the hallmark of this age. It comes to an end with war. Incredible violence. Joel chapter 3 is dealing with the, the, the pinnacle of this age. The, the, the pinnacle is not even a good word. The, the, un, the unfortunate climax of this age. This is what Joel chapter 3 is dealing with. When there would be such a war, such, such incredible violence against God's people that God himself will come and he will fight on behalf of Israel. And we're going to read this here in Joel chapter 3 here in a moment. So Joel chapter 3 is this incredible conclusion of this conflict in the earth, and it brings to an end this age. Joel chapter 3 is also the ushering in of a new age. All right, and let, let's just look, let, let's look at that. All right, what do you suppose Joel was speaking of when he said that multitudes are in the valley of decision? He's referring to all the nations. Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision, in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. All right, so what I want to do is that last question here that says, where will God ultimately dwell? We'll see that here in a few moments. Now, I'm going to read, we're going to read effectively all of Joel chapter 3. I'm going to read that for you. I think we've done it before in this class. I want to do it again. In regards to our discussion tonight, feel free to ask any questions. All right, so remember the, 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 the timeline for the book of Joel. Joel chapter 1, Israel kicked out of the land because of their sin and righteousness. The land will no longer yield its fruit to Israel. They're, 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 they're spat out. Joel chapter 2, he calls them for repentance. He brings them back. He restores them to the land of Israel. At that time, a conflict develops in the nations, right? So now I'm going to read all of Joel chapter 3, and we'll discuss it as we read. Behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. So at what point does he begin this process? Right there it says it in verse 1. When he restored the fortunes of Israel. So when Israel is restored, as we're seeing Israel being restored today, it's hard to not see it, right? Of course, there's a, there's a jostle, there's a fight that, that, that is synonymous with the restoration of Israel. It has to be. But right at this time is when God's going to enter into judgment with the nations. That's, that's, that's what Paul was referring to when he spoke about the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled. Many times in, 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 in Bible prophecy, I hear people look at that statement, the time of the Gentiles coming in, as when the last Gentile will become a believer, and that's when the rapture happens. Where did that come from? <laughs> it doesn't exist. But 
when Paul spoke about the time of the Gentiles, the nations being complete or being fulfilled, he was referring to the time when Israel will be delivered. That's, he, that's what he said. And so it is written, and at that time, all of Israel will be delivered. The time of the Gentiles being fulfilled. When the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, that's when God begins to bring judgment upon the Gentiles. And that's the correct way to look at this. For instance, when God spoke to Abraham about his descendants, the very night that God established the, the covenant with Abraham, God said, your descendants will go into slavery for 400 years, and at the end of that period, they will come out. For the sin of the Amorite is not yet complete. In other words, when they do come out, the sin of the Amorites would be complete. And another way of saying it, saying it is, the time of the Amorites would be complete. And then Israel would become the vessel that would bring judgment against the Amorites. Well, it's the same thing with the Gentiles. The time of the Gentiles is complete. God is preparing to bring judgment now upon the, upon the Gentiles. And Israel, the nation of Israel, is one of the implements that God will, in fact, use to bring judgment against the Gentiles. And of course, there's going to be a very direct intervention on behalf of Yeshua himself. In other words, the great king will come himself with his army and bring an end to the conflict complete, completely. All right? and, and you know what? I, it's an amazing thing that I discovered in researching the Nazarim, the movement of the Nazarim. This is heresy. <laughs> this what I'm sharing with you here about, about you know, the, the coming of Messiah Jesus as a great king coming with his army, the church, this is actual heresy. Anyway, an amazing thing. Uh, according, to, according to Orthodox Christianity. According to Orthodox Christianity, this is heresy. That Messiah will return, literally return, in a literal body, and reign here literally in earth with his army. It's, it's considered heresy. Anyway, verse 3, let's read. It's, it's an amazing thing. They have also cast lots for my people and treated a boy for a harlot. They have sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Complete disregard for God's people, right? Like I talked about this seven-year-old girl that was raped, held down by three men while one man raped her brutally. Disregard for God's people. And why, and the, people are raped all the time. But this particular seven-year-old was raped because she was of Israel. She was Israeli. Moreover, God says in verse 4, Moreover, what are you to me, O Tyre, Zion, Zidon, excuse me, and all of the regions of Philistia? It's amazing. It's interesting that he's addressing Philistia here. And the region of Tyre is, in fact, Syria. It's kind of interesting that he's addressing them here. Are you rendering me a recompense? But if you do re recompense me swiftly and speedily, I will return your recompense on your head. Now, I find it very interesting here that he addresses Philistia and what is effectively the Syrians, the people of the north, the people of the south, in regards to op opposition to God. So again, we live in a time when we're seeing uh, Philistia, all right, the people of the Palestinians, let's not, let's not be confused about this. The Philistines are, in fact, the people that we call Palestinians. The actual Philistines don't really exist today. We're talking about a spiritual demographic and not a literal physical demographic. So I find it interesting that the prophet here, as, as it refers to God's judgment, at this period in time, he refers to Philistia, Palestinians, and the Syrians in the north. See, it's interesting. Since you have taken my silver and my gold, brought my precious treasures to, to your temples, and sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their territory, behold, I am going to arouse them from the place where you have sold them and return your recompense on your head. Also, I will sell your sons and your daughters into the, into, the, into the hand of the sons of Judah, and they will sell them, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken. My goodness. 
God's a little upset here, won't you say? We, again, we typically don't want to see God in this light. So what do you do with this? Well, how, do you, how, do you re- how do you reconcile this? This is what God is saying that he will do. This is God. The same God of the Bible. Not the God that we sometimes want to invent. Right? Sometimes we see God in the Bible and we, we don't necessarily like what we see. So we begin to recreate God based on our own humanistic tendencies. And that's a sin. That's a shame. Because what we're actually doing is we're creating an idol. We create, we, we create an idol. Idolatry is very real among Christians in that we, we create for ourselves a God that's more user-friendly. Another God that's actually biblical. Why shouldn't we be biblical? Why should we not be judgmental? I, you know, if they took my child. Yep. You see, you're using a, a, a pra- you're using a pragmatism that that people sometimes scoff at. You're being very pragmatic, very straight to the point, using applying common sense to this. And sometimes people will will scoff at that and say, "No, that's too simplistic." The God of the Bible is much more complex than that, much more nuanced, and and so they will scoff at the, the at what it actually says concerning God. God is going to bring judgment upon the nations, and the judgment is going to be swift. It's going to be heavy as a result of their rejection of him and their violence towards his people. It's that simple. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and listen, when the day of this judgment comes, no one will be able to say that they didn't have a chance to repent. Not, not a single human being would be in a position to say that, oh, we didn't know. We didn't have time to repent. Everyone will have opportunity to repent. You know, in the book of Revelation, we'll see this when we study in in, uh, Prophets 3. It will state it twice, very clearly, that when God begins to bring this judgment upon the nations, they will know that it's him, and they will curse him, and will refuse to repent even then. All right. So let's go. Verse 9. We're going to read verse 9 to 21. Proclaim this among the nations, prepare a war, rouse the mighty man. Let all the soldiers draw near, let them come up, come up. A reference to going up to Zion. Now you got, you got to see this in, in the right context. Whenever we see a reference to going up or to coming up, it, it, it's referring to where God is. Come up to Zion, come up to Jerusalem. For instance, whenever a Jewish person makes Makes, uh, migrates to the land of Israel, it's always referred to as Aliyah, making Aliyah, going up. In Israel, if you are north of Israel, in Samaria, for instance, or in the Galilee, and you want to go to Jerusalem, you never say, I'm going down to Jerusalem. It's south, right? So we here, if, if I'm going to Miami, I'm going to say, I'm going down to Miami. Why? Because Miami is south of us, Right? Well, in the case with Jerusalem, you never say you're going down. You're always going up. You're always going up. So God is calling the armies up to Zion. That's where he is. And he's calling them up to Zion. Mm -hmm. Come up. Let let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. Beat Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. God is preparing a battle here. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, O Lord, your mighty ones. Now, the last part of verse 11, I believe, my opinion on this is, the shift is a shift here, and the shift is not the nations, where it says, bring down, O Lord, your mighty ones. Remember, he called the nations to come up. Right? He said, come up. Where? Come up to where? Come up to Zion. Because that's where he is. But then the reference here is to bring down, O Lord, your belonging to God, your mighty ones. So who is being referred to here, you suppose? Who is he bringing down? Who? All right, so, so, so who will have the honor of, of, of descending upon Zion? 
the church, Jesus and the church. Whereas the nations are coming up to Zion, his mighty ones are descending upon Zion. All right. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Now the word Jehoshaphat means where God is judge. Jehoshaphat. God is judge. So, so bring them up to the valley from all the nations. You're pointing to Jerusalem, so you're coming up. <laughs> Come on up. God is preparing judgment for them. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come thread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Now, in Revelation chapter 19, which we will not read tonight, there is that incredible reference there to the, to the wine vats. The, the wine, we see it in Revelation chapter 19. That he comes, Jesus comes to press, press, the, the, press the, 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 the wine press of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. The same reference here. It's just seen from a different light. So come thread, the wine press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon grow dark, the stars lose their brightness. The multitudes that multitudes there, of course, is referring to the nations. In the valley of decision, the same valley, the valley, the valley of Jezreel, the valley of Megiddo, the valley of decision. Why is it being referred to as the valley of decision? Because that's, that's where everything is decided upon. Now, we know the outcome. We know what God's decision is. The nations does not. You see... The nations are going to be, by and large, the nations are going to be entering into this blindly, not knowing fully what they're doing. Uh, of course, they're convinced. They're convinced that they're going to win. This, this conflict that's, that's, that's being set up in the world is very complex. It's been in the making for, for centuries. For centuries, man has been plotting and, and preparing this conflict in secret. Yes. Okay, so let's look at the map of Israel. You have Zion over here. This is Jerusalem. And you have Megiddo right here. Okay, so you have a mountain range that begins right east of the valley of Jezreel. So, you have this mountain range here. Uh, it's this mountain range that begins here. It travels all the way south. Now, an army, let's say there's, a, there's an armada of a, a global army that's going to march against Israel. We weapons, munitions, everything. They will avoid the mountain range. They'll look for, for the plain. Uh, easier pass to get to, to, to get to Jerusalem. And that easier pass is the Jezreel Valley into the Jordan Valley and around to Jerusalem. Now they can come straight across from, from the direct west, but they'll have to go over this mountain range, which will make it a bit difficult. More than likely, they'll do exactly what the Bible says they will do. They will meet, they will meet God in the valley of Jezreel, in the valley of Megiddo. So the, 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 the scenario is this. An armada of ships, uh, you know, the D-Day type scenario, right? Suddenly they're, they're out here, they land uh, right about where Akko is, Mount Carmel, and they begin to move in. Their idea is to eventually march south and get to Jerusalem, get up to Jerusalem. This is where God meets them. This is the valley of decision. So God doesn't, doesn't even let them get too far inland. As soon as they get to that place and their, their intentions are clear, He'll descend upon them. In fact, we will descend upon them. That's, that's, the, that's the scenario. So God is preparing this, 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 uh, this battle for us. Let's read. Now, multitudes, okay. Now, this is the Armageddon, this is the Armageddon scenario. Okay? The Armageddon scenario. This is what God is preparing. This is in perfect agreement with what we see in Revelation chapter 19, 
but from a whole different perspective. What we see in Revelation chapter 19 is this, this, this advance. It's an advance, right? Jesus is advancing against an army that's coming against Israel. Revelation chapter 19 is seen, that this, this advance is seen from the heavens coming down. Jesus on a white horse. The armies in heaven on white horses coming with him. And he's coming to do what? He's coming to wage war. That's what we see. In fact, maybe we should at this point go read a little bit from Revelation chapter 19. Let's take a little peek at Revelation 19. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, I think, is one of the more glorious chapters in the Bible. It talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is rejoicing in heaven as God is preparing to bring this conflict to a head. Revelation chapter 19, 11, I'm going to read 11 to 16 for us. This is Armageddon. This is the same exact conflict that we're talking about. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And him who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and does what? Wages war. He's waging war against whom? A world army, a world order that will march against Israel. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him, which, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. This army is referred to up in chapter 19, verse 8. These are the saints who are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And we're coming with him on white horses. And what are we coming to do? Perhaps exactly what he's coming to do, which is to judge and wage war. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is, that, this is in fact, the beginning of the conflict. <laughs> his arrival ushers in the beginning of Armageddon, of course. Uh, the, real, the real essence of Armageddon. And then what we see in the subsequent verses is that he will simply arrest the beast and the false prophet, which is this world system, and he will cast them into the lake of fire. Very, very brief. It's not, it's not a very uh, <laughs> prolonged struggle. Uh, he will seize the beast and the false prophet, the kings of the earth, who, all who are gathered to make war against Israel. He will seize them and he will cast them into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Of course, we're talking about hell. So, so the, the beast, the false prophet, the kings of the earth, and so on, they will be cast into hell at the arrival of Jesus at the hands of himself and us. That's a lot to consider, but that's exactly what it's saying. So now, let's read, let's read beyond where we were in Joel chapter three, nine, uh, 15. We'll go to 16. Now, so this incredible battle is transpiring. Then verse 16 now puts the emphasis away from the valley of Jezreel, the valley of decision, puts the emphasis in Zion. So the focus becomes not the battle anymore. Why? Because the battle is settled. <laughs> right? The battle, the battle it, it's, it's not much of a battle, right? Jesus comes, he's going to seize the beast, the false prophet. This whole, this whole global push against Israel will be captured and cast into the lake of fire. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold for the sons of Israel. So while this is happening, right, uh, God is a refuge to his people, we are included, and a stronghold to Israel, to the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, so Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. So God at this point is dead, dwelling in Jerusalem. He's living in Zion. This is the millennial kingdom. And this is happening through Jesus. 
God himself, the Father himself, will come to that very spot in the new creation. After everything is destroyed, after everything is completely transformed, at the end of the millennial kingdom, God the Father himself will come and make his abode in the midst of humanity. But God is going to dwell in Zion through his son Jesus for a thousand years. And that's what verse 17 is all about. Let's read verse 17 again. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. Verse 18 to 21. And in, that day, the, and in that day the mountains will drip sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go forth from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. Now, I, I love that reference there in 18, because in Zechariah and also in Ezekiel, there are references that talks about, uh, about the house of God, Jerusalem, Mount Zion, being a water source for what? The Valley of Shittim. It's talking about going all the way into the sea of the Dead Sea, which will not be a Dead Sea anymore. It'll be a, it'll be a living sea, sea of life. So uh, Zechariah saw this. Joel made reference to it. And Ezekiel placed a lot of uh, significance on the fact that from the Kidron Valley, from Mount Zion, will come a source of water that will be life to, to the earth. Life, life to Israel and life to the earth. Egypt will become a waste and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah in whose hand they have shed innocent blood. But Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem for all generations. And I will avenge the blood which I have, which I have not avenged for the Lord dwells in Zion. Now, I don't particularly uh, lavish the idea of God being a, a bloodthirsty God. Uh, it's not, no, don't wanna see, I don't want to see God in that light. I want to see God in a completely, from a humanistic point of view even, in a benevolent light. That's, that's how I want to see him. When, when, I'm in, when, I'm, when I'm in despair and I'm crying out to God, that's how I want to see God. Not as a God that will require blood. But if the scriptures didn't refer to God in this way, if God himself did not refer to himself in this way, I would be much happier, speaking as a human being. But the scriptures does refer to, to God in this light, that he's a God that will require judgment. He will require judgment upon those who transgress against him. We may not like it, but it's biblical. So, very clearly God says here that he is going to avenge the blood which he has not avenged. He's referring here to the people of Israel. So to this point, at least for 2,000 years and even beyond 2,000 years, the nations have had their way with the people of Israel. God's people. The people of promise. They've had their way. And we see very little retribution necessarily from God. Well, that's going to come to an end. When God decides to establish his kingdom on the earth, that's when he will avenge the blood which he had not avenged. And he will bring judgment upon the nations. And this will happen according to what we see there in verse 21, for the Lord dwells in Zion. God once again is dwelling on his holy mountain in a way that he never did before. King David, living in Jerusalem, was only a foretype of what we're talking about here. Because what we're talking about here is that the great King Jesus is going to literally place his scepter in the middle of Jerusalem. The scepter will be there. The great king will be there. Literally. There's never been anything like that. Not in the history of humanity. And that's, what we're, that's what the book of Joel is talking about. So this is the conclusion of the book of Joel. And this is the conclusion of our, our study guides. Any questions? No? All right. So we can go back now and take a look at our review. Wow, we did get a lot of study guides done, didn't we? All right, the review, I believe, is on page 20.
Now, normally I would put all the Hebrew words up on the board for the review, but uh, I'm not going to do that tonight because you have all of the Hebrew in your, in your material and, and, and also there's no test necessarily for Prophets 1. Are you happy about that? Yeah. There's no test for Prophets 1. We'll get a test at the end of Prophets 4, which will, which will encompass all of the Prophets. So we're just going to run a review here of, uh, of what we've looked at in Prophets 1. So who are, the prophets that we've, who are the prophets that we looked at? Or who were the prophets that we looked at in uh, Prophets 1? Isaiah, Micah, Joel, Isaiah, and Elisha. These were the prophets that we looked at. Of course, most of the emphasis was on, fact, was, was on in fact, Isaiah. We didn't put a lot of uh, emphasis on Joel, we did, I just did, and we've done before, put a little emphasis on uh, Micah, but on Joel, we, we put a little more emphasis on Joel, simply because of the, the nature of the book of Joel. It's hard not to see the, the, the value of the book of Joel. It's incredible. We read all of Joel chapter 3, and all of Joel chapter 2 is also very good. It's also, it's also very pertinent, relevant to what we're talking about. So let's look at the review. In regards to the book of Isaiah, the early warning prophets are, I just mentioned them, Isaiah, Joel, Micah, Elisha, and Elijah. We see in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah's call to ministry. We see in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, what do we see in Isaiah chapter 6? He's in the vision, he's in the, he's in the spirit, he's in the throne room of God. And he, he, God says, who will go for me? Who will take this message? And Isaiah said, here am I, use me, send me, is what he said. And uh, God, God determined to send uh, Isaiah at that time. So the basic contemporary message is a warning, warning of judgment. All right? So there was a contemporary message that Isaiah delivered which again was, God is going to bring judgment upon you. Isaiah is an early warning prophet, right? He's warning the people of Israel about what God will do if they would not repent. So he's calling for repentance, and he's warning them about what God is preparing to do. So that was his message. Isaiah chapter 5, for instance, let's read a little bit of it. Isaiah chapter 5. Maybe we can read, uh, hmm, what do I have here? Yeah, maybe not all of that. One to seven. Who would like to read first three to six, Isaiah chapter five? Well, listen, we've read this before. It's about the parable of the vineyard. God's preparing to judge Jerusalem, his vineyard. All right, so we've read that before. All right. The basic divisions of the book of Isaiah, we've talked about this before. Isaiah 1 to 35, we see in Isaiah 1 to 35 a series of messages, contemporary, contemporaneous, uh, prophetic, and revelational. All of it in Isaiah 1 to 35. We, we see incredible messages in Isaiah 1 to 35 that deals prophetically with what God is planning for the people of Israel and for the nations. All right, so those are the divisions that we see. Isaiah, now Isaiah 36 to 39 deals only with a contemporary matter that, is, that, Jer that Jerusalem faced at that time, and that matter was the Assyrians coming against King Hezekiah and Jerusalem. All right, chapter 36 to 39. Then chapters 40 to 66, uh, a series of messages that are dealing with Judah, Israel, following the dispersion. And that dispersion, 586 B.C., yes, but beyond 586 B.C. Uh, into 70 A.D. going forward. Now, I, I want to clear something up in regards to statements that I've made in the past. In the past, I've made statements such as 586 B.C. was the destruction of Jerusalem. We know this. And the, the scattering of Israel was not complete. In other words, only a percentage of Judah was driven out of the land. A good majority of Judah stayed in the land. That's historically accurate. 
Uh, same with 722 BC with the Assyrians in the north. Only a small portion of the northern kingdom was initially taken out. The vast majority of them stayed in place. Now, after 70 AD is when most of the people from the north and Judah in the south was driven out or they chose to leave. And in the past, I've made the statement that the land was completely void of her Jews, of her Israelis. And that's not really true. Uh, there were times when, the, for instance, with the Romans, um, Hadrian, when Hadrian had enough of the Bar Kokhba revolt, uh, you know, if you've read about the Bar Kokhba revolt, it was quite, quite a, a rebellion against Rome. And Hadrian decided at that time, well, this is it, no more. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. They had already destroyed the temple and destroyed Jerusalem and, and had subdued the nation tremendously. It was following the Bar Kokhba re revolt, which is a 165 uh, AD, I think it was, that, that much of the Jewish populations of the land of Israel was driven out, but not all of them. And this is my error in speaking in the past. I always said that, that they were almost, that they were bulldozed out of the land of Israel, which they were not. They were driven out, the vast majority of them were driven out, but it was only a matter of 20 years or so, they would all trickle back in. Not all of them. So there was always in the land of Israel a somewhat significant population of Israelis that would come in. Uh, they, 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 they never would, in fact, establish uh, strong cities like they did before 780. Jerusalem would never be rebuilt to, to any standard uh, before, for instance, uh, recent times. But they, they, my, my correction is this. There have been, in history, following 780, pockets of Israelis, small pockets, coming into the land of Israel, seeking opportunities to reestablish Jewish life in the land. But they never really succeeded. In fact, it wasn't until the 15th century that they began to succeed to establish strong communities, such as Sfed, Sfed in, in the Galilee, and, and, and Tiberias, and Hebron, and Jerusalem. Right? So it took, it took that long for them to actually be able to reestablish Jewish life in the land of Israel. All right, so I said that to say that, uh, that once 70 AD occurred, it was a more complete dispersion. Uh, 586 BC was not a complete dispersion, not by no means. 70 AD was, in fact, a more complete dispersion of, uh, of, of the people of Israel. So Isaiah 40 to 66 really deals with that period when Israel would be just about completely, not completely, but just about completely, driven out into the nations. And so Isaiah 40 to 66 now also deals a lot with the, the, the reality of restoration. And then we have also in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 40 to 56, what we refer to as the servant chapters. And so those chapters, 40 to 66, are very important. And prophetically speaking, they're extremely significant. All right. So some of the bold prophecies that we see in the book of Isaiah, the first one there is Jerusalem, Zion will be exalted above all the mountains. It will become the house of the Lord. That's in, uh, we see that in Isaiah chapter 2, 1 to 4. Uh, someone please read 1 to 4, Isaiah chapter 2. We can read a little bit, I think. Isaiah chapter 2, 1 to 4. Anyone? The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nations. 
All right. So compare the verses that, that Brenda just read for us with what we read in Joel chapter 3, 9 to 16. Or somewhere there. It's, 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 it's very much... Right? And, and here, Israel is, is exalted. The nation of Israel is appointed, right? But in Joel, we're seeing the struggle, the battle. Here, we're seeing the outcome of the battle. Right. Jerusalem is exalted, lifted up above all the nations. All right. A son will be born for the throne of David. Isaiah 11, uh, 1 to 5. And it's ref he's referred to there as the Netzer, the Zemach. Netzer, uh, the branch. All right. The nature of the nature. Nature will be restored. Excuse me. Nature will be restored. 11 of Isaiah 6 to 10. Let me see if I can read that. 6 to 10 of Isaiah. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. This is very unnatural, isn't it? Not something that you see much on PBS. No. Also a cow and a bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nurse and child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Then in that day the nations will restore to the root of Jesse. Who will stand as a signal, an ensign for the peoples. And his resting place will be glorious. Now, we all have opinions about verses in the Bible. And having opinions about verses in the Bible is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, in, in fact, it's a good thing because opinions, if, if verified or confirmed, can become points of revelation. All right? So I want to share with you my opinion, which I believe can be a point of revelation, about Isaiah 11, 6 to 10. It says here that on his mountain, unnatural things will happen. Right? A child will stick his hand in the hole, in the den of a viper, will not, be, will not be struck by the viper. A bear will graze, a cow will, will uh, also the cow and the bear will graze together. These things are not natural. They're happening on his holy mountain, right? That's what it says there. Then it goes on in the same verse 9, For the earth will be full with the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. So it's not saying that this will be happening across the entire planet. It's saying that this will be happening on his mountain, but the knowledge of the Lord will be dispersed throughout the planet. So sort of my position is this. Whatever is happening in Jerusalem at this time, it's so incredibly powerful. What's happening? You have a colony of transformed human beings who are no longer really human beings. They're not fallen creatures, right? When you say a human being, it's almost literal, a hue man. You know what it is to hew, right? To cut down, to fall. A hue man. We're, we're, not, we're no longer human beings because we're no longer fallen. In fact, when the church reigns in Jerusalem next, we will be completely transformed. We will be like God. That's exactly what it says in Zechariah chapter 12, isn't it? doesn't it? They would be, in fact, we would be like God. Jerusalem would have a very unique and very powerful disposition in all the earth. Why? Because God is there in Messiah Yeshua and in you as you reign in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem will be holy. There would be a level of holiness in Jerusalem that will not exist anywhere else in the earth. Because at that time, Jerusalem will be an archetype. I guess an archetype is not a good word. But Jerusalem will be a type of the new creation which would come at the end of the millennial kingdom. So in other words, there would be things happening in Jerusalem because of the unique disposition of Jerusalem, things that are not natural. 
But the rest of the world, life goes on as usual. The difference, of, the dis, the difference is, of course, that the, the law of God, the knowledge of God, will be dispensed throughout the world. By whom? By you. You will be the ones who will go out to teach the word of God, to share the knowledge of God with the nations. So you see, the way I see it, uh, this, incredible, this incredible picture here of the wolf dwelling with the lamb and all of these unnatural, incredibly supernatural things will be happening not only in Jerusalem but throughout the land of Israel. It's, it will occur there literally. It's not, I don't think it's figurative. I think it's very literal. And the rest of the world will see it, behold it, and be amazed by it. And, and so that's just my opinion. I guess I'll never, I'll never be able to prove that until, it act, until perhaps it actually happens. Well, I'm not, I'm not one, I am not one who ever says, see, I told you. You can, you can interact with anyone who knows me, and I never, I, never, I never do that. When I'm correct about something, it's done, it's over. I'm correct, so what? But you see, I, I believe it's true, because simply because of what's happening in Jerusalem. The incredible level of, 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 of profound spirituality. D divinity, right? It's divinity because Jesus is there and he's fully divine. He's literally there and we're literally with him. And we're literally divine as well because we're reigning with him. And we're like him in his form. Ah, exciting. So, six. Yes. Yeah. They can come up to Jerusalem. They can never be a part of what's happening in Jerusalem because they won't be transformed. In other words, they can come up. They can come up and, and worship God, but to be as we are, or we will be at that time, they won't be able to be there. Now that can happen at the end of the millennial kingdom in the new creation. When, when all human beings will have that, that particular form. Even then, we don't know, because the church at that time is a priesthood that will function very closely to God and to Messiah Jesus. We will be the new, the new Jerusalem. So what, you, what you're asking for is ill-defined in the Bible, but we know, we know this, that we, the church, will be completely transformed, will be as he is, and we, we know that the form that he's returning in is very much a glorified being, no longer human. He's no longer human. Neither will we be. And we'll reign with him in that particular form. Yes? Yeah. So you have a thousand years of the re messianic kingdom in the earth. Uh, reigning alongside this great Messiah figure, this great king, is his bride, this royal priesthood. Uh, we don't know how many myriads and myriads of beings, no longer human beings, who are reigning with him. We have a dimension of omnipresence in the earth. We're all powerful. We're alongside the great king. And yet, in the face of all of that, there will be rebellion at the end of the millennial kingdom. So the priesthood and, you know, the priesthood in Israel, the Kohanim, they had a very specific list of uh, responsibilities, right? Temple duty, uh, dealing with sickness in the community, uh, disseminating the word of God, and marshalling the community. Those are the four functions of the priests. I believe that when the royal priesthood is established on the earth, we will have the same responsibilities. And we'll be, we'll be carrying out these responsibilities among the nations. So the nations would be benefiting tremendously from, uh, they would be incredi incredi incredibly uh, incredible beneficiaries of what God is doing in Jerusalem. And yet, at the end of that period, 
Satan is released for a short time, it says, and he brings the nations up against God yet again. So yes, it's an amazing thing that that will happen, but we see it in the Bible. It will happen. And that at the end of that period and the end of that um, millennial kingdom, we see this final conflict, which is Gog and Magog, and that's the end of it. That's when God destroys everything and establishes the new, the new Jerusalem. A new heaven and new earth. Old things are done away with, new things come into being. And that's when we have heaven on earth, so to speak. But yes, there is a final rebellion, and it always amazes me that there will be, but there will be. I think that that's an eternal, yeah, I think that's an eternal position, right? Like Paul said, the gifts and callings are irrevocable. Now, Jesus will always be the only way to God. In the new Jerusalem, in that new temple, massive structure, it's literal, it's 1,500 miles cube, huge structure that comes down from heaven, uh, translucent golden walls, uh, 18 feet thick, why do you need a wall? It's God. But for whatever reason, the New Jerusalem is designed that way. Uh, all of the, the, the whole spectrum of the colors of the rainbow are emanating from this massive translucent golden structure. God is there, and the Lamb is there. And of course, if God is there, the Lamb is there, then so is the priesthood, his bride. And so we're all there in that cube. Israel does not come in to that New Jerusalem, neither does the nations. This thing descends from heaven, from the new heaven, upon the new earth, and it's there, and it's there forever and ever and ever. The, the, the hell, the gate, the, uh, the lake of fire has already been, been dealt with. The second death has been carried out. People have been thrown into the second death, the lake of fire. But the new Jerusalem is there, and people are coming up to it. There are 12 gates, which are the 12 tribes of Israel, right? So the idea is that the 12 tribes of Israel are coming up to this new Jerusalem. Now the 12 gates, the 12 tribes of Israel, also has foundation stones, which are the 12 names of the apostles or the church. So the church is ministering at these 12 gates to Israel. And beyond Israel, who is being ministered to by the church is the nations or are the nations. But Jesus is there and the only way to God on behalf of Israel or the nations is through Jesus, his bride, the church. Because the gates have foundation stones that are relig uh, rel 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 relative or re related, I should say, to the church. So the church has ministry in this new Jerusalem. Jesus said, he said, those of you who have overcome everything in this life, in the age to come will sit and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, how? At these 12 gates, right? The 12 gates are for the 12 tribes of Israel, of Israel and you will sit and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So in, in, in effect, for the, for the Israelite in that new creation to come before God, they have to come to the church. And through the church, through Jesus, they can come to God. Yeah, I believe that. Because in Revelation chapter 22, we see that the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. We're no longer the nations, right? We're the bride. We're synonymous. We're one with the Lamb who is in the New Jerusalem. And the nations are there. And of course, Israel is there as well. But, but your question is, is, is important because... There's, there's nothing, there's no death, no more, no, more, no more crying, no more mourning. Old things have done away with, new things come into being. No more punishment, no more sin, a perfect existence forever. The kingdom of God is established in the earth. There is a, there is a temple, right? The temple is, let's think, let's think about the parable of the vineyard. 
the, the, the tower, the Migdal that he had built was the temple. And what was the purpose of the Migdal, the, the, the watchtower? To watch over his vineyard. So when God places the new Jerusalem in the new earth, is for that very same purpose. To watch, to, to watch out or to watch over, to serve his creation. Very same function. So the temple, the, the, the new Jerusalem, which is a temple, will come down out of heaven, will be placed here on earth, it will function as the temple did in the temple era. It will have the same function. God is there, and the nations will come up to see him there. No sin, no death, no crying, no mourning. All things have been done away with. New things come into being. It's perfect creation. It's, it's, it's very heaven. It's what we call heaven. It, I think it would be beyond the Garden of Eden, way beyond the Garden of Eden because, because of the, uh, the, the, the pictures that we see in the book of Revelation 20, 20 to 22. Uh, multitudes of nations will be there. Israel is there. The Lamb, God, the church, the temple. It's a new Eden for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when we when we get in the prophets three, we'll take a long hard look at Revelation chapter chapter twenty to twenty two. I'm not saying I'm an expert on the book of Revelation, but I think I can teach the book of Revelation a little more completely than many do. And we, we will look at the book of Revelation uh, very intently, and we'll see it from a whole different light. It's a very important book, very important. All right, so can we take a break? Um, let's come back at 25 after 9, and we'll resume our discussions. Okay, no, actually, we do have a couple of years to settle in Isaiah. Let's take a look. So nature will be restored. That was the big distraction on the bottom of the distraction. That was the big tangent that we just looked at. There was a rabbit that we chased. So the nation... Isaiah chapter 24, when it comes to the judgment of the nations, Isaiah chapter 24, very vivid. Uh, actually 24, 25 into 26. We've discussed that enough. I don't think we need to look at it again. Then Isaiah 66. Of course, the last chapter... It deals with the new creation. Uh, all things are made new, all things are done away with, a new heaven, a new earth. God said in, uh, in 66, as sure as there will be a new heaven and a new earth that Israel will forever exist before him. That's a wonderful promise, right? Because when you put that in conjunction with, with Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21 deals with the new creation, new heaven, new earth, right? And, and so God is saying, as sure as there's a new heaven, a new earth being prepared, Israel will always be a nation before me. So you can conclude that even in the new creation, Israel is going to be present. And that's a, just a challenging question that I've had to deal with a few times. Uh, I've had people really challenge me, and I didn't have a, a real straight answer for them. How do you know that Israel would be in existence during the millennial kingdom, or even during the new creation? Well, here you have it, right? As sure as there's the, as the new heaven and the new earth will exist, Israel will be a nation before me. So I take away from that that during the new creation, Israel is certainly there. All right, and so in, we also saw the servant chapters. Chapter 53 is sort of the, 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 the epitome, or the, the completeness, I should say, of the servant chapters of Isaiah chapter 40 to, 50 to 56. The seven chapters continue to 56. But 53, and we spent a few, uh, we, we spent a whole class, I think, looking at Isaiah 52 and 53. Of course, Isaiah 52 and 53 is referring to the suffering servant, who is, in fact, of course, Jesus. It's a picture of the atonement, Jesus going to the cross. And then uh, also the, God's word, which is Isaiah 55, 11, uh, 8 to 11, it's referring to the one who sits at the right hand of God, the, God's right arm, right? The one who will accomplish God's purpose for him. 
And then let's go on to Micah. We want to finish this up. We have 35 minutes. So Micah, what do we know about Micah the prophet? He was a contemporary of Isaiah. All right? He worked, uh, he ministered at the same time with Isaiah. Micah wasn't as complete in his writings as Isaiah was. Micah more than likely was an agriculturalist, a farmer, whereas Isaiah was, uh, was well-learned. He was a Jerusalemite uh, of, of the kingly tribe, the tribe of Judah, uh, the, the sons of David. And so he was clearly well-learned and very literate, and he wrote quite a bit. But taking nothing away from Micah, Micah's message is more or less essentially the same message of Isaiah, but not as complete. All right? Uh, Micah had a prophecy concerning end times. Excuse me, no, I'm sorry. Micah uh, associated with, was associated with Bethlehem. He made an association of Messiah and Bethlehem. Isaiah chap, uh, Micah chapter 5. We, we, we discussed that uh, two weeks ago, I believe. Uh, Micah chapter 5 deals with Bethlehem, right? Least of Mount, all of the tribes, uh, but the Messiah will come from you, from you will come the one who will rule over Israel. We, we talked about that. Uh, Micah also saw Messiah and the dispersion, that Israel, during the dispersion, during the Messianic period, there will be a different type of dispersion. Uh, during the Messianic period, Micah chapter 5, that Israel will go out, not as a driven nation, or a nation under God's judgment, but a nation that will carry out God's judgment. Isaiah chap uh, Micah chapter 5, we see that. All right, now let's talk about the book of Joel quickly. We, we already talked about the book of Joel. I think we talked about that at length. Um, Joel, Joel prophesied actually before Micah and before Isaiah. He's roughly 50 or 75 years prior to Isaiah. And his message came, he was one of, of course, I think Obadiah was the earliest of the prophets if I'm not mistaken. Maybe someone can research that real quickly. I'm, I'm pretty sure Obadiah was the, the, the earliest of the prophets. Prophesying somewhere around 850 BC. That's way back there. You're talking about, you know, during the early king period, the early kingly period of the tribes of Judah, the kings of Judah. So this is Obadiah. Obadiah was, again, the first of the prophets. Then followed Obadiah, I, I think, pretty sure was Joel. So Joel is a prophet who prophesied very early on. Um, his, his message was early warning, right, for repentance. But that repentance came in Joel chapter 2. After, after uh, Joel made it clear that Israel would be driven out. So, so Joel really wasn't calling for, for, for repentance. Joel, again, three chapters, simple message. God's going to drive you out. There's sin in the camp. God's going to drive you out. And while you're out there, you're going to repent. And from there, I will restore you. Then I'll, I'll bring judgment upon the nations. Very simple book. Of course, we see in Joel an incredible end-time prophecy, right? I think uh, the, the prophecy that we see in Joel chapter 3 concerning end times is perhaps one of the most powerful prophecy that we see contained in one chapter, uh, concerning end times anywhere in the Bible. Uh, the book of Revelation is sort of the, the cat's meow when it comes to judgment, right? But we, we don't see it all contained in one chapter like that. Not in the book of Revelation. It's spread out throughout the book. But in, in Joel chapter 3, we see sort of a, a, a synopsis <laughs> of what's contained in the book of Revelation concerning judgment. Now, Zechariah chapter 12 I guess 12 is, is also in the same vein, but it's not extensive like what we see in Joel chapter 3. We'll talk about Zechariah another time. Don't want to confuse the issue. All right, so Joel also saw that God's Spirit will be poured out on all mankind. Yes, upon all mankind, but most, uh, most appropriately here, it will be poured out on the sons of Israel. Now, Taking nothing away from the fact that the church, uh, the, on the day of Pentecost, that Shavuot, 2,000 years ago, received the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Taking nothing away from that, okay? 
That absolutely happened. And in fact, the baptism of the, 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 the baptism of God's Holy Spirit upon the church is ongoing. Every time someone is baptized with the Holy Spirit and Messiah, it's pointing back to that day of Shavuot. It's, 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 taken, away, it's taken from that particular Shavuot. Powerful. Now, this, oh, this promise also relates to Israel and to the nations as well. There will come a time when the nations, even the nations, will receive this. Perhaps not in the same way that the church did. But Israel, Israel will receive a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I can't say it would be exactly like what the church experienced on the day of Shavuot. But the difference between Israel's Shavuot or Israel's Pentecost and that of the church is that Israel will experience Pentecost, this outpouring of the Spirit, on a national level. And I'm not sure which is, quote-unquote, better, right? The church received it, certainly on a, on, a, on a corporate level, but not on a national level. Israel will receive the baptism of the Spirit on a national level. Ezekiel saw this in Ezekiel chapter 36. Maybe we can go take a peek at that. Let's take a look at it. Ezekiel chapter 36. Mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 36, 27, uh, 27, 28, but 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live on, so, it, so 38, uh, 28 is not so appropriate. But God is saying here in 27 that he will put his spirit within Israel, the nation of Israel. He's speaking collectively. So all of Israel will receive this incredible promise that Joel spoke about. Uh, all, of his, all of mankind will, ex will have this baptism experience. Now, again, for, for as, long as, as long as I've been a Christian, which is um, 19, uh, when, when did I actu actually accept Jesus and beca became born again? 1991, January of 91. So for, this period, for that period of time, I've always heard about the great revival that's coming. Never seen it, haven't seen it yet. I've seen the signs of it. The signs of the revival are certainly there. Uh, the conditions for the revival are, are there. But haven't seen this great revival that, that's been preached about, talked about so often. Now I believe it's coming. I, I absolutely believe that there is a great revival coming. And I won't take anything away from what's happening in places like Africa. And, and even in the Arab world, uh, in the Muslim world, I understand that there, there's something of a revival happening in the Muslim world. Uh, people are having epiphanies. Uh, beyond epiphanies, they're having Christophanies seeing Jesus, appearances of Jesus. And he's interacting with them and he's speaking to them and, and, and people are being converted. If I can believe the, the testimonials that, that, that you can read about on the internet and in magazines and so on, I've seen them. So there is a revival in the Islamic world and it's, people, are, people are turning away from, from Muhammad, so to speak, and they're turning to Jesus. Now, it's a revival, but it's not happening on a grand scale. Okay, it's happening here a little, there a little, and, the, and just the enormity of those little things happening, it's so incredible that the word of it is going out, right? And so people write about it, people discuss it, and it's, it's happening. I don't know how many cases there are, but it certainly does not uh, constitute a, a, a legitimate revival. Perhaps it's the beginning of a revival, like I said. But in Africa, for instance, there, there is a powerful movement, the continent of Africa, of Christians that are just being over, 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 overtaken by the Holy Spirit. And it's happening. It's been happening in Africa for about 50 years. We don't hear much about it because it's a third world country. And to be quite frank with you, the first world doesn't care much about the third world. Not much. Especially Africa especially Africa. The good things that happen in Africa, we hardly ever hear about because it's Africa. But there are good things happening in Africa. And, and there are also bad things that are happening in Africa, even in the Christian world. Okay? And there, there are really some ugly things that are happening in some of the churches in Africa. All right. 
Let's leave Africa alone. So there is a, re a legitimate revival. It's real. This revival has to spread across the entire planet. Uh, who, needs, who needs a revival more than Europe, for instance? <laughs> you know, we look at Africa and we say, oh, well, they, those, those heathens, they certainly need a revival, and there is a revival. In fact, I, I might say that in time to come, Africans would be going to Europe to bring, to bring them to revival. We never know. But there are countries around the world that are hungry and desperate for revival. You have China. How is that going to happen? China. You know, China is a communist fortress. And the Christians of China are strong. They're strong and they're very persecuted right now. But they, 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 who knows, maybe God will do something, ignite a fire with the, the, the Christians in China, create revival in China. India and Pakistan, there, there's some strong believers in India and Pakistan. I interact with people from Pakistan and they're very committed, they're very much on fire, they're very persecuted, intimidated and crushed, but they're very much in love with Jesus. But, but you see, none of this constitute a legitimate revival where the Spirit is being poured out on all mankind. But that, I think this will happen. And if you would allow me to share quickly, since we have a little time, um, when we study, when we study in, in Prophets 3, we're going to see that the period of time that we will look at in Prophets 3, particularly what I will refer to as the Great Tribulation. Great Tribulation. We're talking about a time, a period that, that, that's uniquely referred to by Jesus as the Great Tribulation. Jesus said that there would be tribulation. But then he went on to refer to a time of Great Tribulation. If you put that in conjunction with what we see in the book of Revelation, this great tribulation period, it's a time of awesome, awesome uh, calamities that will occur around the earth. Natural catastrophes and so on. But it's also a time of, of incredible display of God's power. Okay, so on one hand, we're, we're seeing horrible things happening in the planet, God's judgment, and on the other hand, we're seeing God move in a very powerful way. Very vivid, very vivid. I think the people, the people at this time, during this period, the people on the planet that are committed to hate God and to hate his people will not consider what God, is, what God would be actually doing at that time. So there will be no place for a revival among those people. But on the other hand, there would be a vast, vast portion of humanity that will consider the awesomeness of God and what he will do during that period, and that's where the revival will happen. So what I'm saying is the revival will happen, this great revival will happen, but it will happen during the time of great tribulation. As human beings, we are, our be we are at our best when things are at its worst. That's just the way we are. When things become really, really trying and testing, that's when we step up and we do what's needed to be done. That's how, that's how we're made up. That's how we're designed. So I believe that during the tribulation period, humanity, a good portion of us, will experience this incredible outpouring of God's spirit. It's going to be incredible. I don't, I don't know just exactly how, 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 to con how, how it will be constituted, how it will happen, where it will happen. You know, a lot of people are saying it's going to happen in Brazil, it's going to happen in South America. I don't know. I do know, I knew, I do know for sure it's going to be powerful when it happens. And God's Spirit will be poured out upon humanity, just as the prophet said. It will be everywhere. It will it, be sort of a, it will be God's way of saying, look at what's happening around you, and you know what it's pointing to. Look at the evil that's in the heart of man. Make a choice. What, what's going to be your choice? And I think God's going to ask that question of all humanity. But according to the book of Revelation, the leaders of the world will not repent. In fact, they will harden their hearts towards God and they will continue in, the, in their mischief. They will continue in their rebellion against God. It's kind of amazing. You'll see it when we study in the book of Revelation. All right. So, of course, Joel talked about the judgment of the nations. We just read all of Joel chapter 3. All of the prophets are going to, you know, to some extent, deal with the judgment of the nations.
So let's talk about Elijah and Elisha, the last two prophets. They were early warning prophets. Well, Elisha certainly was, but Elijah more so was an early warning prophet. Uh, most, most, most obviously when he called the children of Israel in the northern kingdom to repentance. He said, if God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, then serve Baal. How long will you waver between two opinions, right? So, so he, certainly he was an early warning prophet. He warned the northern kingdom. And there was repentance. There was repentance. Uh, but it wasn't long sustained. After, after a generation or two, the northern kingdom went right back into rebellion again. All right? So uh, early warning prophets, Elisha and Elijah, we, we talked about how Elisha took on the ministry. He took the mantle, literally, but symbolically, taking the mantle of Elijah was taking the ministry of Elijah. So Elisha followed in the ministry of Elijah. In fact, I think from what we see with Elisha and what he actually did uh, in destroying Jezebel, I think that a, a large part of what Elijah had to complete was, in fact, the destruction of Jezebel. And the fact that when Jezebel confronted Elijah and he took off, it speaks to the fact that that was the thing that Elijah had to do. Once he took off and basically ran to, uh, to Mount Sinai, God said at that time, your mission is over. You ran from the very from the very entity that you were here to, to destroy. So God took Elijah at that time and he appointed Elisha, and Elisha didn't stop until he carried out the mission, which was to destroy completely Jezebel. And what was, what was the problem with Jezebel? She had a few problems, but what was the main problem with Jezebel? We talked about this quite a bit. She was a witch. She was practicing witchcraft. She was a daughter of the high priest of the Zidonian uh, high priest, Tyre. She was a witch, right? And that was, that was pretty bad, but, but beyond that, now if she was a witch, if she was Jezebel, living in Tyre, like other Zidonians did, she wouldn't have been a problem to Israel, right? The problem with Jezebel is that she was queen. She was a queen. She was married to Ahab. She was a queen in Israel. She had no place in Israel. God would have likely, likely left her alone if she had continued to live in, in Zidon and not meddle with Israel. But she was meddling with Israel, and that's the point. She was leading the northern kingdom, the children of Israel, in Baal and Ashtara worship. Beyond that, what else did she do? Something really, really hideous. Beyond that, what did Jezebel do? Beyond being a queen in Israel, which... Nothing like that should have ever happened. What else did Jezebel do? She had her daughter, Ataliah, installed in Jerusalem as queen. In Jerusalem. That's, that's where it really went south for Jerusalem because following that, that, that thing where Ataliah became queen in Jerusalem, that's when there was no more hope. It seemed inevitable that God will destroy Jerusalem because of what she did. And what did she do? She murdered her. Right. Why? Why did she murder her grandchildren? Because they would challenge her. Here was a woman, a daughter of Jezebel, bringing to Jerusalem the same spirit of Jezebel, controlling, manipulating, uh, witchcraft, which is witchcraft. Uh, and, and, and horribly, horribly uh, despotic, destroying her own flesh and blood so that they won't contend with her. <laughs> now, it's because of a compromise that Ataliah became queen in Jerusalem. Who remembers the compromise? Bring peace or unite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, no. Um, Jezebel's husband was Ahab. Ahab didn't want to unite anything. No, he, 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 his no, no. He, yeah, no. What, what happened was Jehoshaphat, the, great, the good king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, 
wanted to make peace with Ahab in the north, in the northern kingdom. He had a good idea. You know, the, the, the road to hell is paved with good ideas. Good intentions. He had a good idea. And the idea was to somehow consolidate the kingdom and, and unite the kingdom. And, 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 uh, and, and Jehoshaphat went up to the northern kingdom to fight alongside Ahab against the Syrians. God never ordained such a thing. Right? God didn't. In fact, whenever a prophet of God stood up to speak in, in, in Samaria, he was against it. The prophet said, if you do this, you'll be destroyed. If you go out to fight against the Syrians, you're going to be destroyed. And yet, Ahab went out and he did it anyway because he was determined. And so was Jehoshaphat. And because of that, that alliance, we have Ataliah, the daughter of Jezebel, as queen in Jerusalem. Horrible, horrible sin. And she brought really, really contamination upon Jerusalem. So now, now back to the original statement. If Elijah, instead of running off to, to Mount Sinai when he was confronted by Jezebel, instead of running off, if he had planted his feet and said, no, I'm appointed to get rid of you. <laughs> That's why I'm here, to get rid of you. If he had stood in that type of faith, then perhaps Ataliah would have never made it to Jerusalem. You see? Perhaps she would have never been installed as queen in Jerusalem. And, and, and listen, I'm, I, listen I'm, going to, I'm going to meet Elijah one day, and I'm going to have to speak to him face to face. But uh, I'm convinced that Elijah made a horrible mistake by running away, by running off to, 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 to Sinai. He should have planted his feet, and, said, and he should have said, I'm, a, I'm God's prophet, I'm Elijah, and you're not going, you're not going to destroy me. Because that's what Jezebel said. Surely I'm going to destroy Elijah. And he took off. And I think it's because of that we had Ataliah installed in Jerusalem. And ultimately the, the destruction of Jerusalem came as a result of Ataliah. Anyway, that's the end of the, uh, that's the end of, unless there's more to it, and I don't think so. That's the end of the review. So Prophets 1. What, what, what would you say is the essence of Prophets, prophets 1? God saw the sin of Israel way before 586 B.C., in fact. He saw the sin of Israel all the way back at Mount Sinai. In Leviticus chapter 26, he stated very clearly what, what he will do with Israel if Israel were to continue in unrighteousness. This is Mount Sinai now. This is before the 40 years in the wilderness. After the 40 years in the wilderness now, 39 years later, I should say, the book of Deuteronomy was preached by Moses. And in the book of Deuteronomy, 39 years later, Moses makes it very clear that Israel, you will rebel against God. You will. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 4. And when you do, God's going to drive you out into the nation. So at the end of the 39 years, God saw clearly that Israel she was committed to rebellion. And so God knew, even at Sinai, even at Mount Nebo, that Israel would ultimately reject him and he would have to drive them out into the nations. He sends Isaiah the prophet to, to get them to repent. So when God sends a prophet and he calls you to repentance, part of that is to hold you accountable if you don't. You see, because that's what he did with Israel. He held Israel accountable when they did not repent. Isaiah brought the message of repentance. Micah brought the, me the message of repentance. They didn't fully repent, and so then they were held accountable for their actions. How, does that, how did that serve the people of Israel? That whole dynamic, what happened there? Think about it. Think about it. God said to Israel at Mount Nebo, book of Deuteronomy, that when you rebel against me, when you act corruptly against me, I'm going to drive you out into the nations, and there you will serve the works of man's hands, stone and wood, and, and, but nevertheless in the last days I'll bring you back and restore you. So they come into the land after Mount Nebo, and they begin to transgress against God, just as God said that they would. 
So God brings them now to the prophet Isaiah, his ministry, you know, 500 years later. And the message of Isaiah is, well, you can repent. Repent. But yet, God knew very clearly that they would reject him and he would have to destroy Jerusalem. Even in Isaiah chapter 5, right? The parable of the vineyard. God said that he will destroy his migdol, his watchtower. And he will scatter his vineyard, Israel. He said he would. Isaiah chapter 5. So even when he was calling for repentance, he knew that Israel would reject him and transgress, which they did. So how does this dynamic serve Israel? How did it? How does it? Well, I'll tell you how. Now, today, Israel can look back and see the incredible, I can't use the word providence, but they can see the incredible sovereignty of God, knowing that God knew that they would sin, and yet he was merciful in that after he drove them out, he had planned a restoration. And so now Israel can look back and say, when God calls for repentance, we must repent. We should be attentive to God's word. And listen, this is exactly where collectively the Jewish nation is. Not all of Israel. Uh, quite a bit of the Jewish people don't believe. They, they are traditional. They are, they, are, they, are, they are cultural Jews. And they don't really believe in God. You know, they can, they, they can create God as they go along. Right? Uh, I heard, uh, you know, I have a, we have a rabbi here, and, and I hear him all the time, and, and then... The statements that I hear, they're, they're very upsetting to me anyway. It's as if God is not a real person. Now, now my, my position is that God is real. His word is real. This is the word of God. It's a little different with other people. Other people have leverage and latitude. I don't. I don't have latitude. The word of God settles it for me. And so, but, but the Jewish people, by and large, they are repentant before God. And they've learned from the mistakes that they see at Sinai, at Nebo, in Jerusalem with Isaiah. And now they can look back over the last 3,000 years and see the error of their way. And today, for the first time ever, I think, they're able to make amends for their past sins. Which is exactly what God said they would do in Leviticus chapter 26. That the time would come when they would make amends for their, for their sin as a nation, which is what Israel is doing today. For instance, Leviticus chapter 30, 26. God specifically said, if you do not observe my Shabbats, and the Shabbats that he was referring to are the agricultural Shabbats, the land Shabbats, and so on, the, 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 the jubilees and so on. If you do not, he said in Leviticus 26, here's what's going to happen. And he outlined judgment that he would bring upon Israel. And Israel did not honor his Shabbats. And he drives them out into the nations. And what we see in the same chapter is that he's going to give the land its Shabbats. That's what he said. He will allow the land to enjoy its Shabbats. And at the end of that period, he will bring them back and restore them. Well, today, restored Israel, the Jewish nation today, they're very careful about observing the Shabbats. Very careful. Why? Because they've learned from their mistakes. And they will not dare turn against God like that again. Now, quite frankly, God would have preferred it if they would have obeyed him in the first place, right? It would have been much better for God and for them if they had you know, observed his word from the very beginning, but they didn't. Yet God is a God of redemption. I think that's the important thing for us to see here. And that's reflected very much in the prophets in the book of Isaiah. God's a God of redemption. Because at the end of the book of Isaiah, everything is redeemed. A new heaven, a new earth. And just as there's a new heaven and a new earth, Israel will forever be a nation before him. Restoration, complete. So the book of Isaiah, a wonderful book. In, in fact, it is in fact the, the, the premier prophet. He is the premier prophet. He is the the, the first of the prophets, I guess you can say. And in Prophets 2, we'll begin to look at Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. These are prophets that are going to define God's judgment upon Israel. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. We're going to see that uh, God had, had prepared judgment 
uh, well, in fact, he prepared it long in advance, but uh, Jeremiah is going to call for repentance a couple of times, and then God's going to say to him, stop calling for repentance. Stop praying for these people. In other words, Jeremiah wasn't necessarily called to, appointed to call Israel to repentance. Jeremiah's message, we're going to see, is very different. His message is centered around preparing Judah for judgment. It's coming. It's, it's, you can't get away from it, Israel, Judah. You can't get away from it. You just have to surrender to it. And that's not a good place to be when God's prophet is telling you, surrender to his judgment. That's not a good place to be. But that's where Israel found itself, Judah, Jerusalem found itself uh, during the time of Jeremiah. And he's going to call Jeremiah to surrender to God's judgment. And by and large, they do not. And God, this, this God drives Judah into uh, Babylon, and, uh, and then, then so we'll study that when we come back next uh, semester. Next semester, our first class will be September 10th. September 10th, 10th, and uh, we'll come right back, and we'll get right back into prophets too. Any questions? Yes, yes. I had I had before. Uh, appointed next week or next Tuesday is the last day of the class, but I, I managed to get, get, get along pretty quickly, so this is the last uh, class for until next semester. So, Tuesday, the, the 10th of uh, September will be the next class. So, Yeah. At, at this time, we're going to continue meeting on Tuesdays. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Monday. Monday. We're Mondays. So, so we're going to probably will shift to Tuesdays. I'm not sure yet. Usually, the first, the, the first, the new class, the new, the new form class, would uh, want to meet on a Monday, like you guys did. Uh, you, you started meeting on Mondays, and I moved the second year class to Tuesday. So you guys will move to Tuesday. I'm sorry. If that's all right with you, and this is what we have to talk about. Would that be all right with you, Tuesday night? I think, I think it's, is it the 11th or the 10th? Yes, the third will be uh, orientation for the new class. Let me, let me, uh, we, we, we're all, we're all part of the congregation. Let me get back with you when, once we form the new class, I have to interact with the people um, about, about their, their availability, what times they can, what, they, what days and what times they can meet. So I'll, I'll keep in contact with you. You just put it down as saying what you did last time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in another, another month and a half, I'll put the sign out and we'll begin to promote the, uh, the first year class, the new class. So I'll, I'll get back with, with each of you about whether it will be Monday or Tuesday. But typically, we'll move from a Monday to a Tuesday if, if, it's, if we're all good with that. All right? So uh, have a good summer. <laughs>